I would like to start by thanking Professor Philippe Menard for inviting me to uh, participate in this conference. Usually I lecture before audiences of archaeologists, and uh, this is the first time I lecture about this issue to a more general public. Uh, so I'm afraid I'll have to learn more than <laughs> I can tell you, as uh, you said before. As you see, the name of the lecture is uh, The Archaeology of the Killing Centers, Problems and Prospects. And uh, I'll start with a short background, which is a factual background and an archaeological background to what we know about these places. This is based on a paper that we published a couple of years ago, which is practically the first attempt to summarize this issue. Uh, and I'm glad that Professor Menard decided to publish it here, so this article will also uh, be more available uh, now. And many points that I will not have the time to make now, you can consult this paper, which is, by the way, a free internet download, and uh, consider it further. Uh, if you see, I'm using Hilberg's definition. Uh, killing centers, and you can see that uh, the list of killing centers uh, I give here, those uh, marked in red, are uh, going chronologically. Helmeno, Belgets, Sobibor, and Treblinka, the days that they started to operate. <coughs> and these are typologically, archaeologists like typology of things, these are typologically very unique and very similar. Mostly the three, uh, the three extermination or killing centers in the east, which are Treblinka, Sobibor, and Belgians. These are different in, let's say, archaeological typology from the places that are not just killing centers, but are also concentration and killing centers, which means that archaeologically, for archaeologists, they pose a totally different challenge because as you see, they stand, there are structures, or if they are not structures, they are the basis of the structure. So archaeologists, uh, in some aspects, have nothing to do with them. Moreover, since they are with the structures and since they were saved, uh, they stand there and there are monuments and museums and no one is going to excavate them shortly. So that's another reason I concentrate on the four killing centers per se, and especially about the uh, killing center of the Einsatz Reinhardt, the Operation Reinhardt. Uh, this brings more the uniqueness and the uniformity of these camps together because these places were constructed or conceived, constructed and run by the same group of people. Most of them are the uh, T4 group. Uh, and uh, first of all is Globochnik. Lobotsnik, who was the head of the operation, and then Christian Witt, who was uh, the, the, the lead. Uh, he constructed the places, he devised the ways, the practical ways to do it. And one of the famous uh, uh, commandants of first Sobibor and later, uh, and later Treblinka, Franz Stangel, who gave us a very important uh, account of what he did by being interviewed by Gita Sereni. And so, although he died immediately after being interviewed, still a lot of important evidence is recorded by him and other people that were in these Reinhardt camps. Archaeologists are interested in two things, in structures and in artifacts. So in terms of structures, we have a tip the, the typical structure of an extermination center. I'm using here the, temp, the, the term center. I prefer it on the term camp. And this is, of course, different than killing site, which may be something like Ponar or, or Babiar, etc., etc. So you can see a killing center. Uh, here in this uh, example, it's Sobibor. You can see, first of all, the train. That's the vein of life of such a place, or the vein of death, unfortunately. And then opposing it immediately, besides it, you see the, what that so-called the Vorlage, which means the place where the German and the Ukrainian auxiliaries operated, and all the facilities they needed. Behind it is camp number one. That's an official name by the Germans, too. You can see where the arrow is. This is camp number one. Camp number one is the place where 
the Jews' slave work stayed. These were people, for example, who were working in, uh, in sorting, packing, cleaning, anything that the Germans needed. Camp number two is the place where the Jews were uh, brought, uh, asked uh, to take off their clothes. Everything they had was taken and sorted and stored for a while in the big stores, store uh, places, the barracks. And this, that's camp two. Camp three is the actual extermination place. You can see the gas chambers, the mass graves, and the Zonderkommando barracks. These were people that were working on a permanent basis, as whatever this um, word means. However, the Germans made attempt to keep them for long periods of time since they were trained people, so they tend to uh, use them more and more. Camp 2 and Camp 3 were connected by a passage called the Way to Heaven. Uh, the important thing is what I show you here, you go to Treblinka, it's the same, you go to Belgium, it's the same. Helmeno is different, <coughs> since in Helmeno, we'll uh, show it later in a minute. Helmeno, there are two centers. One is a castle or a palace where people were brought to, taken through to the gas chambers, uh, sorry, to the gas vans, and about four kilometers <coughs> away, they were disposed, the, the, the body were disposed mainly here in a forest, in forest clearings, and uh, and, uh, bur and mostly burnt. Now going to the archaeology, Belgets was the first extermination center that was excavated. It's since the, it has been started to be excavated in the uh, mid 80s, and you can see uh, in, uh, samples of what I call structures and artifacts. Uh, Helmeno is unique since it had a structure there that was used for the extermination process prior to the, uh, to the uh, Nazi uh, persecutions. The idea was people will go here through the corridor of death and led to the, sorry, and led to the uh, gas vans that will uh, kill them and uh, drive to the uh, nearby forest. A, a variety of places was excavated by uh, Lucia Pavlicka Novak, both in the castle and in the forest. And you can see a typical uh, group of uh, artifacts that can be, again, typologically divided by archaeologists as, let's say, artifacts for general use, be it nails, be it bottles, etc., etc. Artifacts of personal use, be it jewelry, and maybe a subcategory is artifact of uh, Judaic, which means, for example, uh, Mogen David, uh, th that's a picture of Moses carrying uh, the Torah, etc., etc. So uh, there are masses of artifacts and both structure. Belgets was excavated since in the second half of the 1990s by a Polish archaeologist, uh, Andrei Kola from Turon University. And uh, by the way, Belgets today is practically non-existent as an archaeological site. The entire site turned into a monument. It was covered by these black stones you can see here from the air. However, before it turned into a, a monument, uh, it was excavated, as I said, by Kola, and Kola found two things that are of importance beyond the artifacts we'll so soon see. First of all, he devised a method to define the mass graves archaeologically, and, uh, and you can see them here, and this is what made part of the monument, because this is what he published as the result of research, and this is you can see here the same uh, structure uh, uh, in the building or in the des des designing the, uh, the site. Again, you have all the variety of artifacts, uh, as I mentioned before, of general use, of, uh, of uh, 
Judaica, uh, even here you have a, a box of cigarette, a metallic box of cigarette, owned by uh, Max Mund, Vienna, 1927. Uh, the third site I mentioned is uh, Sobibor. It was excavated first in, the, in 2000 or 2001, again by Kola, and then by a, a team, a Polish-Israeli team, Mazurek, Chaimi, and uh, myself. For example, you can see here the uh, the spread of the mass graves. This was a unique and in a way problematic way uh, to uh, delineate the, the, the contours of the, uh, of the graves because the method he used was to dig every five meters, not to dig, so to drill. So he took about a six centimeters drill and drilled everywhere. When, he, when the uh, drill came up, when the core uh, was uh, full with human remains, let's say, or human fat, he decided as part of the grave. And when it was just sand, by the way, all these places are made of pure sand naturally. It was not a grave, so he could outline the, uh, the uh, structure. Sorry, the uh, layout of the artifacts, and in addition, in both places, he found structures. For example, you see a structure in uh, Belgets, a structure here. This structure, for example, he claimed was the gas chambers or the remains of the gas chambers, which I personally doubt. This structure he regarded as a garage. And uh, the same here, you can see either actual pieces of structures or remains of structure that can be reconstructed like the case here. And again, the same uh, things, the same kinds of different artifacts. Uh, by the way, false teeth, fragments of false teeth are found everywhere and not just in extermination centers. Uh, some things are, in, uh, are interesting archaeologically. For example, here we have a brown, a, a brown a fragment of a bottom of a Lysol bottle. And you, usually people connect Lysol with uh, keeping clean, which is most probably the case. And there is evidence from people, for example, who survived so before, that they had to do Lysol washing to garments. However, this bottle, for example, now if you look at it in, uh, in an archaeological view, this bottle is a small bottle. It's about, uh, let's say, three or four hundred milligrams. So these bottles were not probably used by the Nazis in order to clean around. And more probable that this, this is like that. This is a personal belonging that was brought to the site by people that were transported to the site. Uh, it is uh, well publicized in the 1940s and 30s in the United States that Lysol is one of the best and uh, reliable birth control. So who knows why such a bottle was brought to the uh, place. Treblinka, the last place, I simply just show it because there is nothing archaeologically. The site was never excavated or never tested in archaeological times. Before I begin, I would like to make just one or two uh, comments considering my general approach. As you know, the archaeologists, the historical archaeologists, which mean archaeologists like biblical archaeologists, archaeologists of Greek and Rome, that deal with sites and artifacts, but with documents. And another school are the prehistoric archaeologists that have to deal with archaeology without sites and uh, so, sorry, uh, without documents, so uh, they adopt what we call an anthropological approach to archaeology, which means the source of uh, coming up with conclusions is what people do in uh, parallel cases. So uh, I think I'm one of these who, although appreciate the history, I'm trying to look uh, let's call it down to earth to what we uncover. And uh, these places in terms of down to earth should be 
looked as places with where there were perpetrators and victims. Because my feeling is that uh, more recently, even archaeologically, we are very inclined towards the victims and we deal less with the perpetrators. And another problem is down to earth. People were living there and we have to go into the details how they did it and how they survived, for example, in such a place like Treblinka and Sobibor. Some of the problems are associated with this line of research. <laughs> in the archaeological research, we have very different archaeologies. And these are formal names of uh, uh, branches of archaeology that either have journals or have books and have uh, people that work in the, in the framework. And this is just, just the archaeology of the last centuries, let's say. I'm not talking about biblical archaeology or Greek and Roman archaeology. I'm talking about conflict archaeology, social archaeology, combat archaeology. You can hear from the name that most of them are 20th century archaeologists. <coughs> Critical archaeology, which is quote unquote postmodern archaeology, forensic archaeology, etc., etc. However, I think what we <coughs> most <laughs> adhere to is public archaeology, meaning we pay attention to the impact of what archaeologists do on the public, for example, museums or artifacts to show. And the second is the historical archaeology, which is uh, the archaeology that is being practiced in the last 500 years. Sorry, not practiced, but is researching the 500 years. However, recently, and recently I mean you see May 2012, there is a new kind of archaeology, which is called Holocaust archaeology. As and is immediately related to what we are doing here. This is by a British scholar called Caroline Sturdicals. And uh, what interests me, and I think what interests us, is her definition of, of the Holocaust, because from here comes the uh, Holocaust archaeology. Well, first, uh, it is a European wide event, and that. Uh, more than 11, peop uh, sorry, 11 million people died. And for example, one of the sites, one of the two sites she gives as an example is Ardenay in the Channel Island, which is off the coast of France. Uh, I doubt if many of us have heard the name Ardenay in the context of Holocaust at all. Uh, however, this place was occupied by, uh, by the uh, by the Germans, so uh, it is in part of it. So we have a very general definition of archaeology, of, sorry, of Holocaust archaeology. I stick to my killing centers as a, a place, and my definition of uh, the archaeology is more compact. Uh, it is the study of material remains, mainly artifacts and structure, uh, and the topography uh, of the genocide of six million Jewish people. That's for me the archaeology, and that's what I'm going to discuss here. One of the major problems archaeology faces, and here you can see uh, it's from early this year, the beginning of this year, the BBC News writes, any doubts about the existence of mass graves in the Treblinka death camps in Poland are being laid to rest. I wonder who among us has doubts concerning the mass graves of, uh, at, at Treblinka. And this is the BBC. So I think that, his, uh, that this uh, uh, message goes to uh, Holocaust deniers, because only they do not believe. Which means archaeology is taken now as a kind of proof to show that these things really happened. And practicing in the field archaeology and practicing this kind of archaeology at Sobibor, I can tell you that this is a very serious problem and it should not be adopted. Uh, one of the great historians of this, uh, of the Holocaust and of Nazi Germany, uh, combating post-processual, uh, sorry, uh, post-modernist, etc., uh, claimed that 
here we have the gas chambers, which mean archaeology, the artifacts, the structures, so people cannot tell us that they didn't exist. And I think you can see the archaeologists immediately pick after it. Uh, this is a classical textbook of historical archaeology, so archaeology will fight back those who deny the Holocaust. And I say it's a big mistake and we shouldn't do it because we have gas chambers at Auschwitz. We have gas chambers in Treblinka. And they do not believe or they deny their existence. So going back to the sites I'll so soon and try to uh, locate gas chambers there is nothing to change the ideas of these people. And my dictum is, a geography professor after events, we do not uh, argue with people who think that the earth is flat. Uh, a major problem in the archaeology is the fact that the Germans erased the sites. For example, here you see how the site of Belgium was operating in the 1940s. You can see how it was left erased in 1944. But as I mentioned before, Kola found here in this place this structure, which he calls garage, which means although it was uh, erased, eliminated, there are still chances to uh, find remains of uh, the activities taken there. Uh, the sites were also excavated by, immediately after World War, by uh, groups of, uh, of uh, I mean, by research committees. Uh, the camps are still today being rubbed and my experience two years ago, we went to Sobibor and the morning we came, we saw that someone was yesterday night digging probably with a, uh, with a, with a metal detector in order to recover artifacts. Uh, and it was known that the places were robbed systematically since, the 19, since 1945. And here we have a famous picture of people in the uh, Treblinka era sitting in front of skulls and bones that were recovered in their attempts to uncover artifacts. And people even opened shop, shops in Warsaw from the money they made by recovering artifacts. So the archaeologists are not the first going there. However, if they save the artifacts, but the uh, public will enjoy them. If they do not, other people will make the uh, money of it. And of course, we have to be very careful because what we are doing also destroys the sites. For example, bull bulldozer obliterated the trace of the center. And moreover, this is a picture of what happens in Helmeno. And that you, what you see here, all this dust, etc., is what archaeologists left behind. You can see. So uh, that's a problem we are causing, and we should be uh, aware of it. Some prospects. First of all, artifacts. Uh, artifacts are uh, very important, not just only in terms of reconstructing what happened or uh, learning about the origin of people or the provenance of artifacts, but also for educational reasons, because uh, artifacts make direct contact with people that see them and feel them and feel through them what uh, happened. And here you can see, uh, for example, a, a fragment of a false teeth with a date that was scratched on it. And the date is October 1940. So someone in the Western Polish, po 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 Poland made a note of it. Uh, you can see artifacts from uh, Helmeno brought to the London War Museum and they represented them and they attract people. And of course, they even, uh, there is even research cons considering the connection between archaeology classroom and the Holocaust. So uh, the work of archaeology and coming up with the uh, profusion of artifacts, and we are talking about thousands and tens of thousands of artifacts in each, in, in each place can contribute immensely to uh, education and better knowledge of what happened. Another kind of artifact, uh, just if we dig enough, maybe we find in the killing pits 
in, uh, in the graves, dozens of buried documents, mine and others, that will illuminate things that happened there. Okay, we know the guy who wrote it, we know uh, he was a member of the Sonderkommando in Auschwitz, and he and his colleagues, friends, buried the documents. So we can still go and find them, although I doubt what can be found about 60 years afterwards, because this document you can see here that was found a couple of years after is already partially ruined. Uh, another aspect, the last aspect, is the spatial and functional aspects. For example, just for Sobibo, see how many maps we have, how many reconstructions we have. Let's look at a couple. You see here the map of Sobibo. This was how Sobibo was planned to be uh, reconstructed and presented to the public. So what you see in red is what exists. What you see in green and black is the camp as it was. And what you see in blue is the reconstruction. So here it is the gas chamber. This is the way to heaven. And here the Jews were gassed and buried in the pits. Our research proved that it's not true. That the, that the, uh, that the way to heaven and the gas chambers were found somewhere here. So just in order to avoid such mistakes, I think that uh, that's the prospects of what we are doing. And the last, beyond structures, we have garments that also can be found, of course, although uh, rarely, or parts of garments. Here, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that in Belgium, people were dressed like that. Uh, and I thought first that it's from the first you know that Bel Belgium was used as a concentration place in 1940-41, and then in 1942 it became an extermination center. So I thought that's from the first round. No, these are Jewish prisoners, Jewish couple, and uh, you can see the way they are dressed totally different from what we usually think about. Now we have also descriptions uh, for example, the one given the description or the testimony given by Richard Glaser from Te Treblinka uh, to Gita Sereni, uh, that these guys had a totally what we call material culture than we think about. So this what I call down-to-earth approach, I think, is one of the prospects and one of the contribution of the archaeological research. So I would like to conclude with the statement that I think I showed, any source may have significance, although it's not a source and from the historical point of view, it's of course a source from uh, the research point of view. We should highly uh, look or highly appreciate artifacts because artifacts are one of the few uh, spheres that we can show to people, discuss with people, <laughs> influence people. And the last point I made is the down-to-earth look at life in these places. Thank you. Mm -hmm.